Hi everyone and welcome. Today I want to talk about the myth of learning styles and talk about how learning styles are ineffective, but I also want to discuss alternative approaches to learning and teaching in formal education. We're going to be on Prezi today and I'm going to talk about what is learning. Now there are various stages to learning. We have attention, encoding, storage, and retrieval. Let's focus a bit on attention. There is a lot of stimuli in the world, and much of that stimuli everywhere are fighting for our attention. We have lights and we have sounds. We have basic senses. Everybody knows the five senses of sight, smell, touch, hearing, and taste. We also have many other senses such as proprioception, equilibrioception, our vestibular systems, thermoception. In some, there are a lot of environmental elements that are always fighting for our attention, but we also have hedonistic adaptation and that we're able to tune out a lot of stuff. Now, when you're learning, you don't really want to tune out the content that you're learning. You want to be able to remember that. But hedonistic adaptation is everywhere. For example, if you're wearing socks right now, when was the last time you actually thought about the fact that you are wearing socks? It was probably shortly after you put them on. And you may be tuning out all kinds of other information, such as a hum of a fan or lights, other ambient noise. There's a lot of stuff going on, but we're able to focus our attention on a select few. Now, when we talk about attention in terms of memory, a lot of times we compare it to something like a computer. So in a computer, if you're typing up a Word document or creating a PowerPoint presentation, then you're able to put all of the information there and then you're able to save it. You can store it because you don't want every single document on your computer open all the time. You close things down, you file it away, but then when you need that document, you're able to open it up and put it on the computer and refer to it. Our memory is the same way. We have to get, provide attention, we have to encode it. We want to store it away because we don't always want to be thinking about everything but we want to be able to recall something when we need it. So that's the basics of learning, but let's look at learning styles. You've probably heard of this. It's formally called the meshing hypothesis. And by the way, the link on the screen there is a write-up published by the American Psychological Society, and it's one of many write-ups that they have looking at the research available on learning styles. Psychologists have been researching learning styles for many years, and that's the idea that learners have preferences and that teachers should accommodate learner preferences. So you've probably heard that visual or spatial learners learn best by observing, oral or auditory learners learn best by sounds or songs or rhythm, and verbal linguistic learners learn by words or speech or writing, physical kinesthetic learners learn by using their hands and their bodies, etc. Now this notion is very popular, but in reality the meshing hypothesis is not a valid approach to education. In fact, there is no scientific evidence really to support it, and there's a lot of evidence out there saying learning styles are not effective and they're not good uses of resources because they're not an effective way to learn or to teach material. Despite hearing about learning styles for decades as the holy grail in education to personalize learning, we know through research that it simply isn't. It's not an effective approach for teachers or for students. And how do we know that learning styles are not effective? Well, we've done research. Some examples of research is that researchers will put students into groups, and one group will receive a list of words. So they'll see the words written in writing, and they'll list something, such as house, desk, chocolate, backpack, and such, and they'll rehearse the list, and then they'll engage in a different activity, and then come back and be assessed. How many of these words can you remember? Another group will receive the same list, but they'll receive it in terms of pictures, a picture of a house, a backpack, a table. And again, they'll rehearse, they'll get distracted, they'll come back, see how much they can remember. A third group would hear all of the words through auditory channels. All the words will be spoken, and then they'll assess how many can you remember. So we have three different groups. One group reads the words, one group sees pictures of the words, and a third group hears a list of the words spoken. And what we found is that there is statistically no significant variance between the different types of learning styles, regardless of what group people are placed in. Now, it seemed that verbal learners should do better listening to the words than somebody who's not a verbal learner. And likewise, a verbal learner maybe wouldn't do as well as a visual learner when the words are presented via pictures. But we've simply found that there is no difference, regardless of the learning styles or regardless of how it was taught. Now, a variation of this study is that you can have participants read a story, and then you would test for full comprehension. In this case, half of the participants would come from various different learning styles, and then the other half would be specifically those who would respond well to a story that's read to them. And likewise, you can explore variation where students see a film. 
And again, half of the participants would espouse different learning styles, and then the other half of the participants would respond well to multimedia. And what we found is just no statistical variance. There's no indication that one learning preference is better suited for a particular learning style than another. But this concept of learning styles is still so ingrained in us, and where does that come from? Now, you may have seen charts like this one. It states, and this is erroneous, I'll just mention at the beginning, that you only recall 10% of what you read, that maybe hearing something, you would recall 30%, but seeing and hearing combined, you would recall 50%, and if you actually do it, you would recall 80%. This graph, similar graphs like it, have been floated around for years, but the problem is that there's no science behind this graph. There's no primary research supporting any of the data here. And I'll mention as a side note, for any of you who do research, you know very well that when you have data, raw data, it rarely or pretty much never falls into clean categories of 10%, 20%, even rounded. You would have to be incredibly generous, but you're not going to see a 10, 20, 30, 50, 70, 80. Not in real life. Now, the cone on the right comes from a 1969 publication, and it's been floated around the literature as well. However, the publication that this came from wasn't primary research. And whether that was responsible for the graph that we see on the left, I don't know, but both of these have been floating around. But there is no primary research saying that learning styles are actually effective. Now, this is bad form, but I'm going to read something to you. Very few studies have even used an experimental methodology capable of testing the validity of learning styles applied to education. Moreover, of those that did use an appropriate method, several found results that flatly contradict the popular meshing hypothesis. So once again, there is no empirical evidence suggesting that learning styles are even valid, but there's a lot of evidence saying otherwise. So are we to suggest that there is no type of learning styles, that we should just disregard it altogether? I'm not actually saying that either. What the meshing hypothesis specifically says is that, and again, this is erroneous, but if a learner has a certain preference, then you should present the content to cater to that preference. But I'm going to suggest an alternative. Let's look at some subject matter and analyze. So suppose I am either learning or I'm teaching somebody how to swing a golf club, how to hit a golf ball effectively. Now I'm going to purport that it doesn't really matter the learner's supposed learning preference, because the truth is that you're probably not going to learn how to swing a golf club very well by reading a book, by listening to a podcast, even by watching a YouTube video. The best way to learn how to swing a golf club is to actually swing the golf club. And so this isn't something where kinesthetic learners have a leg up on everybody else. It's more, no, this needs to be taught by kinesthetic means. We need to get out there, we need to have them swing golf clubs, we need to give real-time feedback and modify the behavior and that's really how you're going to learn how to swing a golf club well. You're not going to learn it from a podcast. However, what if I am teaching people how to recognize the variants, the different types of songs that songbirds sing? Now, I could write a book about that, maybe a blog post. I could create a YouTube video. But in reality, that YouTube video would only be effective if I actually compare and contrast different types of songs that songbirds sing. And so what matters for this isn't exactly the relationships of students. We're not looking at visual or kinesthetic learners. Really, the best way to distinguish songs from songbirds is to actually hear them. Now, let's look at another example. What I have here is a description from Wikipedia. This was copied and pasted from Wikipedia. It talks about the composition and the structure of a violin. Now, you don't even have to read this, but just look at the concept of, have, of presenting all of these words to try and describe a violin. Now, let's take this image, and the image has fewer words, but it really seems like it conveys more information. It's perhaps more useful. I don't have to tell people a distinctive feature of a violin body is its hourglass-like shape and the arching of its top and back. I can actually see that. And that's not to say that you should never have text or narrative, but maybe supplement it with pictures. So we're always looking for what's the most effective way that we can present the content. We don't want to focus on the students and the student preferences. We want to focus on the content and how can we do justice to the content that we're teaching so that students can learn it in the most effective way, a way that would be meaningful for them. So and sometimes the most meaningful way for them to learn something is to take them to the golf course and have them swing some golf clubs or to show them a picture of a violin or to have them listen to songbird recordings. So that's the myth of the learning styles, but 
I don't want to leave you there. Let's talk about what actually does work in education. What's the evidence? What are the approaches and strategies that we can use to become better teachers and so that our students can more effectively learn in the classroom? So in addition to doing justice to the content as opposed to le the learning preferences, let's look at some different study techniques. Now let's assume that this is a schedule. We have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, and we're going to study different things. And this could be various things. It could be a college student. It could be a grammar school student. And let's pretend that green, red, yellow, and blue, that these are different subject topics. It could be math and social studies, science. It doesn't matter the topics. And this is pretty typical that you're going to spend large blocks. Now this could be the entire day. Monday is my green day. Tuesday is my red day. Blue isn't until Friday. But there's this natural tendency to dedicate large blocks of time to learning one subject. In reality, that's not as effective. What we want is some variation. We want some shorter intervals and we want to interleave the learning. In other words, I don't want to have only Wednesdays be my yellow topic. And then I go a week until the next time I study that or even a few days. I'm going to study it a little bit each day. Studying something a little bit each day is better than dedicating large chunks of time to just one thing. And let's take that and go one step further. We're going to divide the chunks into smaller chunks. Those could be 15, 30 minute, an hour intervals. But essentially what we're doing is we're doing short drills. And that's good for learning all kinds of things. It could be subjects for school. If you're trying to learn chess because you watch the Queen's Gambit, then what you don't want to do is say, okay, today for five hours or for one hour, I'm going to be studying opening moves. And then tomorrow I'm going to be studying my end game. You want a lot of variance. And a lot of research has been done this. If we call the top group A, the middle is group B, and the bottom is group C, group C in the long run outperforms groups A and B. And this isn't just for studying. It's not just for comprehension of school materials. This has been studied with other things, such as sports, doing different drills. You don't want to only practice one aspect of the sport on one day and then the next day pick up something entirely new, you want to always be changing things up. Whether it's baseball or basketball or football, you want to be doing different drills and always be running around doing different things. And in the short term, your group C is not going to see the gains that group A sees for those individual things. But in the long term, group C always outperforms. Now, one tendency that we do see from group A is that they dedicate these large amounts of time, these large blocks of time, and they're looking for aha moments. You know, that time when it just something clicks and it just makes sense. But in reality, those aha moments can be really bad because they can be superfluous and they can make us feel like we've mastered the content, but it's really a false sense that we've mastered it. So we feel like we've mastered this, then we're going to go on and learn the next thing, but we don't revise it because we figured, okay, we already got that. But we always want to revisit that content. And what we don't want to do is overcompensate our mastery of subjects and content. So group C may get fewer aha moments at the beginning. They might not get aha moments for a very long time, but they're much more likely to master the content and remember that content farther down the road. See, the schedule for group C, it makes our brains work really hard, but that's a good thing because that strengthens the connections and the neural networks in our brains, and we want those connections to be permanent. So I recreated this graph from John Medina, a neuroscientist. I saw him speak a few years ago as a, at a keynote at a conference. And he talks about variable interval learning. Essentially, what we're looking at is booster shots of learning. And so this could be various things. One, two, three, four. This could be first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth, or it could be different subjects, or it could even just be different semesters. But the thought is that you progress along. Once you finish number one, then you move on to number two. But periodically, you'll come back and visit number one. It's kind of like receiving a number one booster shot. Yes, you've done it before, but we still want to keep it fresh. And then you move along to number three, you're going to get a number two booster shot. And then number four, maybe you'll get booster shots from the previous times. I have young kids. So first, second, third, and fourth, there's this notion that, okay, you finished first grade. That means you know all of that stuff. We're going to move on to second grade and we're going to move forward. But in reality, you do want to revisit this, some of the stuff from first grade. You want to keep it relevant. You want to keep it in your brain. You don't want that to be forgotten. And you don't want to move on just thinking, well, you've already done that. You've checked off that box. And so that box is permanent ink. Same in grad school. You know, these could be different classes of grad school. And as the program goes along, you want to revisit, especially if it's something like stats. Yes, you finished the stats class. You got an A or a B or whatever, but you passed it. You moved on. 
but you still need to see stats in later classes because you need to revisit those concepts and keep them fresh so that when you finish the program, you can show competency and mastery of everything that was taught in that program. So I want to do an activity with you. Our short-term memory, we're able to learn roughly about seven plus or minus two things and keep that in our short-term memory. That doesn't mean that next week is to remember it, but for a moment, you can remember about five to nine items on average. So I'm going to go ahead and present five to nine random alphanumeric characters, and you can go ahead and view them for a few seconds, and then I'm going to pause the video, and then I'm going to take them away, and we'll see how many you can remember. So here it is. I'll even read them out to you. How about that? 385J72RU6. All right, so again, the concept is that that's between five and nine items, and we can remember seven plus or minus two items. So about five to nine items. And I've been talking, so I've kind of distracted you a little bit. Now let's pause the video and see how many you can remember. Go ahead and write them down or say them out loud. Okay, I assume that you paused the video and now we're back. And how did you do? Did you remember all of them? And how easy or hard was it for you to remember all of them? Now let's do another activity. Let's do a variation of that. I'm gonna present some more random alphanumeric characters and let's see how many of these you can remember. I'm going to put them on the screen right now. So this is FBI 911 NBC DEC 25. Okay, now before you start writing them down, just listen to what I'm saying right now. And now I want you to write them down now. Okay, so how did you do with that? Okay, let's look at both of them combined. So did you do better on the first one or the second one or about the same on both? The second one, surprisingly, I said, you know, seven plus or minus two. So five to nine, you should be able to remember, but that's actually, that's actually 14 characters. But I'm going to guess that if you're from the U.S., you probably did pretty well on that second one because those characters have meaning for you. you know, FBI, meaning the Federal Bureau of Investigation. You have 911, a telephone number you call in emergencies, NBC, the TV show. DEC 25 looks like December 25th. You could even tell yourself a story. You could say that an FBI agent called 911 because NBC wasn't displaying the Christmas program. Something silly like that, but it would be a lot harder to construct meaning from the first characters. Even though it's just nine characters, it's much fewer. So for some of our students, what we're teaching might appear like we're teaching Greek, but our purpose is to construct a narrative to make it meaningful for them so that they can actually remember it. Tell them a story. So we talked about the myth of learning styles. Now let's talk about learning theories. Learning theories are different than learning styles because they're actually based on research and studies, empirical data presented in peer-reviewed journals as opposed to learning styles, which really are pseudoscience. So I'll give an overview of these learning theories, but really these are things that you want to look up and research on your own. But we have behavioralism, constructivism, cognitivism, and there exists more than this, but I'll focus on these for now. So with behaviorism, we're looking at increasing or decreasing behavior, learning behavior in this case, in terms of the classroom content. We either want to introduce something or take something away so that we can increase or decrease behavior. If you want to increase behavior, you're looking at that first column of encouraging behavior. For example, it could be study habits or good classroom behavior. Then you can do that by either positive reinforcement when they do good behavior and you want to encourage them to do it in the future, you give them a reward. Or negative reinforcement would be taking away something so that you encourage the behavior. Whenever you get into a car and you turn it on, then you're going to hear a repeating ding sound and that doesn't go away until you put your seatbelt on. So the car is teaching you through negative reinforcement that if you don't want to drive around town all day with this annoying sound, put your seatbelt on and then that will get rid of the sound. Now, if you want to discourage behavior, you want to reduce the behavior from happening, then you're looking at punishment. There's positive punishment. If you do this bad thing, then you're going to get this bad thing happen to you. A pet owner might carry around a bottle of water and give their pet a spritz in the face if they do some bad behavior. And that's an innocuous way of teaching them that this isn't a good thing that you did. And so if you do that again, you're going to get this positive punishment. Negative punishment is like having a pie on the table at dinner time, but the kids don't get the pie unless they eat their vegetables. And if they don't eat their vegetables, in that case, not eating the vegetables would be the behavior that you want to discourage. In that case, you take away the pie and say, you don't earn this pie. You don't get it until you eat the vegetables. That could also be like positive reinforcement. If you do eat the vegetables, I will give you the pie. But refusing to eat your vegetables as a behavior, I'm going to punish that by taking away something good. Now let's look at constructivism, personally my favorite learning theory. Now here we have a picture of a beach. 
you have various elements here. You have sand, you have waves, you have water, you have sky, you have a horizon line, you have footprints in the sand, you have shells. And that there looks pristine and perfect, but that's not what we get in our classroom. Instead, think of this picture like a puzzle made of various pieces, and everybody, when they come to class, they bring a handful of their pieces, and people have different parts of the puzzle. In reality, the puzzle is going to look something closer to this. There's going to be some pieces missing because we don't have all knowledge. We have to construct reality based on the knowledge that we have. And the resources we have are a textbook and course materials. We have a professor or instructor. We have fellow students. And all of us bring what we have together. Now, a professor might have taught this class many times before, but they haven't taught the content to this particular group of students. And these students have different backgrounds. They have different education and experience, life experience, age. They've had different struggles and trials and triumphs in their lives. And so I show this image here knowing that there are some pieces that are missing and we might not have the entire picture, but we can really fill in those gaps. And I'll be honest, the picture is probably going to look a lot closer to this. There's so much that we don't know about anything. We're always learning. There's always new journal articles being written and textbooks being introduced. But the amazing thing is that even though most of the pieces on this image here are missing, you can still make out that there is a beach. You can still make out that there's a horizon line, that there's a sky. You can tell the weather. You can see details in the water. You might not have a pristine picture like the first one that I showed you, but we still have a lot of information. And that comes from each other. That comes from everybody in the class contributing their pieces of the puzzle to construct a new reality. Now, cognitivism is great. This goes back to that first example of our memory being like a computer. We have a lot of sensory memory. There's a lot of stuff going on. We're always registering different things. We have temperatures. We have hums and noises. What we really want to do is focus on those inputs that are related to the course content, what we're learning right now. Get those into short-term memory and rehearse those like we do with the activity. How many of you still remember FBI 911 NBC DEC 25? And no, I didn't look that up. That was just from the activity that we did before, but we rehearsed it a few times and we talked about it. We constructed a reality. So all of that is part of that short-term memory process. And the idea is that we want to get that into long-term memory so that we can recall it when we need to. And that's the key. It's that when you need information, then at that moment, you can get that information. So there are various components of cognitivism. We'll talk about some of these things here. Visual aids are incredible because people, when they're trying to learn words, they learn words better when they're paired with images. And that's supported by the science. Better recollection when words are paired with images several days later. So it's good not just to have a, a set of flashcards in front of you and flip through, but you want to put pictures with those flashcards. Mnemonics can be fantastic as well. How many of you remember from second or third grade when you're learning the colors of the rainbow? You learn maybe Roy G. Biv or something similar. Or did any of you learn the expression, my very excellent mother just served us nachos which sounds very silly. Actually, it doesn't sound silly at all. I could use some nachos right now. But that's a mnemonic for remembering the order of the planets. Take the first letter, my very excellent mother, M-V-E-M, -E and you can remember Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Here's a mnemonic that I use. When I see the word gray written out, if it's G-R-A-Y, I remember that comes from America. That's the American way of saying gray, because A stands for America. If it's G-R-E-Y, that E comes from England. And a lot of us remember when it comes time to change our clocks that we spring forward and we fall back so that we know which way the clock goes when it changes. And let's just get away from daylight savings time. Can we just evolve as a society where daylight saving time doesn't exist anymore? That's my plea. So metaphors, analogies always help solidify the content as does concept mapping. And concept mapping is fun because there are a lot of different platforms that can help with that things like Padlet, even ThingLink, Canva. So that can be a very fun approach to cognitivism. I have review quizzes at the bottom there, and quizzes are very important. It's important to test our knowledge. Now, ideally, the quizzes should be very low stakes, and they should be frequent. But one of the good things about quizzes is that it helps us determine what we don't quite know. Or there's this phenomenon called the tip of the tongue phenomenon, and that can be incredibly powerful. It can be a powerful tool. So if you have something and it's on the tip of your tongue and you can't quite get it, then try. Do what you can to get it. If you're watching a movie and it's like, oh, where do I know this person from? I, I almost got it. But don't pull up that IMDb app. Don't look him up on your phone or on the internet. 
Instead, try and think of things. Okay, do I remember what movie he was from? What was the movie about? Do I know a letter? A letter of his name or her name? What was the plot of that movie? Did that movie have a co-star? Because much of our memories are associated with other things. And so if you can remember certain concepts, then you might be able to leverage this paired association. And paired association is incredibly strong in our brain. And so if you don't look up that actor or that actress on IMDb and you're able to recall it, then you're strengthening those neural networks. And that's a very good thing. Some honorable mentions here. We have humanistic learning theory, neuroscience, andragogy. Andragogy is different than pedagogy in that it focuses on adult learners. So I suggest definitely look up humanistic learning theory. It's fantastic. Neuroscience is also great. Have you ever smelled a candle or smelled something? And then again, there's that paired association. All of a sudden you're transported to your childhood. That's an example of declarative and non-declarative memory working together. Now, if you can leverage that in your classroom, really leveraging that paired association, then you can strengthen the student's ability to recall content. Now, andragogy is interesting because adult learners are a different breed than children. So pedagogy versus andragogy is really a different thing. Adult learners learn because they want to learn. They're more independent, they're responsible for their own lives. They tend to take mistakes more personally, and that can actually affect their self-esteem sometimes. But they also bring a lot to the table in terms of diversity, experiences, education, their backgrounds. And you also want to realize that adult learners actually learn at a much slower pace than children, but they have an equal capacity for learning. So I never want to hear adult learners being intimidated by things like coding or design or something that might be new to them. Don't think that we're stuck in our ways and that we're not capable of learning anything because we are. So I'm going to bring us back out again and I'm going to talk about one last thing, which is the community of inquiry. And hopefully you've heard of this, but there's, there's a lot of research behind this. And essentially it's this concept that the teacher needs to be prepared for the students to be able to interact with the teacher, with the other students, and with the content. And so the content of your class might be a textbook or journal articles or videos or any activities that you do. Teacher obviously needs to be a subject matter expert for those things and then be able to interact with the students. And so we see interactions between students and teacher, the teacher and the content, which should happen before the class starts, and then the students interacting with the content. And if you find a nice equilibrium, then that can create a great learning environment for the students. Now let's talk about when the community of inquiry is off slightly. So first, here you have the social aspect and you have the teachers. So you have students and teachers interacting with each other, but there's no content to be found. So that's an unstructured classroom. That would be like a high school study hall. Next, we have the teacher that monopolizes all the time and realizing that students need interaction. They need to spend some time to talk with each other and to talk with the teacher. It can't just be one way. So this Mickey Mouse scenario here is also not ideal. There are other times when the content is king and the teacher is just dialing it in. The teacher doesn't really interact or engage. They just say, here's the textbook and then you'll have exams. You know, that's the same thing as sending students to the library and saying, go learn at the library. And that's not great. Next, we might have the novice teacher here where they just really don't have a presence. They're around, but the students are dialing. And this is different than having a guide on the side approach where the students are dominating the conversation, but the teacher is, is present. Ideally, the scenario I think is that the students are fanning the sail, but the teacher always has his hand on the rudder or she's always guiding the ship. And that's really what we want to see in the guide from the side model. So again, with the community of inquiry, we're striving for that nice interaction. And feel free to look up more information on community of inquiry. There's a lot of research out there, and it's a very solid learning theory. So these are my thoughts about the myth of learning styles. I don't want us to be pigeonholing ourselves into thinking that learning styles are important because when a student really believes that he or she is limited to a certain learning style, then they disregard learning in different types of styles. And a teacher might not put as much effort into a student because they might have that label of, oh, well, you're a kinesthetic learner, so you're not going to benefit from this podcast. And then you run into things like self-fulfilling prophecy and downward spirals. So let me know in the comments what things you agree and disagree with me on. And I hope to see you again on our YouTube channel, YouTube slash How to Canvas, as well as our website, howtocanvas.com. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to this video and feel free to connect with me. Thanks for joining me today and happy teaching and learning.